Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. This is our hour, our weekly hour, regularly devoted to issues of particular importance to people of African descent and to others fighting to build a better community, a better society, and a better world. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, and today we are going to talk about that better world in the very specific context of the United States of America and the even more specific context of the legal framework that guides the lives of those of us who live here. Uh, late last year in 2022, um, I was surfing through uh, television and uh, came upon a lecture given last fall, a remarkable lecture by our guest today, Professor Kermit uh, Roosevelt III. It was an interesting lecture where Professor Roosevelt, who's professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania, counterposed some very different ideas about the founding of the United States, the constitutional basis for this government and this society, and how central conflicts have shaped and reshaped the society we live in. Uh, he raised some very interesting counterpositions. Uh, the founders constitution versus the reconstruction or the uh, constitution. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. Insiders versus outsiders, rupture versus continuity, uh, justice versus unity. I'm like, hmm. And after watching that lecture, I said, man, I have to go get this book that this brother just wrote, The Nation That Never Was, Reconstructing America's Story. So joining us today for the hour is Professor Kermit Roosevelt, He's a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania's Cary Law School. Shout out to Penn Law. And as an adopted Philadelphian, also thank Professor Roosevelt for taking on one of our HBCU students, one of our best and brightest, Layla June West, who uh, works with him as a research assistant. He teaches con law there, constitutional law and conflict of laws, among other things. Uh, he graduated from Harvard College and Yale Law. Uh, he worked as an appellate litigator with Mayor Brown in Chicago and clerked for both D.C. Circuit Judge Stephen Williams and Supreme Court Associate Justice David Souter. I may ask him about that a little bit. Uh, he's a reporter for the American Law Institute's Third Restatement of Conflict Law of Laws. And we'll ask him about this later on in the show. He served on the Presidential Commission of the Supreme Court of the United States, making some interesting insights and some recommendations even about what might be done to reform that third branch of, of, of uh, the government here in the United States of America, the federal judiciary. So welcome, Professor Roosevelt. Welcome to the Black Table. Thanks so much for having me. Really happy to be here. Oh, man. Happy that you were able to join us, man. Um, this book is, is fascinating. I mean, when, as you open this text and you talk about the nation that never was, quoting Langston Hughes, which you know, is near and dear to many of our hearts. Let America be America again. Uh, somebody you revisit near the end of the book. When you when you pose the idea that somehow we might fundamentally reorganize the way we think about the United States of America. Um, it was interesting. And, and I want to ask you this, maybe open it up, because, of course, you open the the uh, the book. With Monet Davis, the homie, <laughs> shout out to Hampton <laughs> University Pirates, <laughs> where she found a home after after high school. Could you talk about how you opened this text and why how you counterposed Monet Davis and Roger B. Tony, brother? That was that was a nice little, little twist there. Please lead us into the text. So. Yeah, well, so I used the Monet Davis story because it, it was incredible. I thought when it happened, like these things that I was learning. And then it also seemed like this is really what we're doing in America. So Monet Davis, I'm sure a lot of people know, great success story from Philadelphia. She was the first girl to pitch a winning game in the Little League World Series. And like pictures of her were everywhere. Everyone was like, wow, it's so great. The Taney Dragons, this Philadelphia team are doing so well. They made it all the way to the semifinals. And I was seeing pictures of her. And I was like, oh, you know, Taney, because it says Taney across her shirt, because they play at the Mark Ward playground at Taney Street. Mm -hmm. And then... I started looking into that a little bit more and other people have pointed this out. It's not Taney, it's Tawny because that street was named for Roger Tawny. So Monet Davis, inspirational underdog showing, you know, in America, anything is possible, goes out to play with Roger Brooke Tawny's name written <laughs> across her shirt. And he's the author of the Dred Scott decision, right? The decision that says that blacks can never be US citizens that says that blacks have no rights that the white man is bound to respect. And so it's this stunning juxtaposition, right? Here's what we like to think about ourselves. We like to think America is a land of opportunity and talented people can achieve and all the doors are open. 
but we've tied it to this terrible, terrible repressive past. And then we've also sort of forgotten the significance of that. So people see the name Taney and they think, oh, it's something different now. Um, you know, and, and we can sort of get past that and we don't need to worry about it. But then the question that I was asking and sort of what this book is about is, is there a better way? Um, you know, do we have to tie ourselves to this terrible past? And, you know, it's very vivid with Monet Davis, but the story that we tell ourselves about America more generally, where Thomas Jefferson articulates our fundamental ideals in the Declaration of Independence, does the same thing. Because you look a little bit more closely at Thomas Jefferson and you're like, wow, that guy enslaved his own children. Um, interesting that he's sort of the one who articulates America's deepest values. That's a problem. So can we solve that problem is the question. Interesting. And and in 13 chapters with a tight bibliographic essay, and uh, for those who might think that it would be daunting to read, uh, they, they imagine this might be a treatise from a constitutional law professor. It is not that. You were very deliberate about that. In fact, you wrote to a much wider audience and, and the language is compelling. It's very open. It's very inviting. And I encourage everyone to read this text and, and take, a, take a, this journey that you have us set on in the text. But in the process of doing that, uh, you convene really a remarkable range of thinkers. I mean, uh, you know, Sean Wilentz, who I'm sure we'll talk about when you go into the no property and man thesis. Um, but Cedric Robinson is in there, too. And Gerald Horn, you know, my friend Gerald Horn. And I mean, he's been on this show and I'm thinking, man, you, you're you trying to hurt all these cats. And you talk about this idea of a we. And, and, and I hope maybe in this first block, you could help us understand why when we say we, we don't always mean all of us. In fact, maybe we never mean all of us. When you say we in this text, in the context of America, who do you mean and, and, and why? how do you use that concept of we? Well, there are a bunch of different we's in the book, you know, and, and sort of ultimately we is aspirational, I think, because we do want unity. We want a nation where we can say we the people and we mean everyone and it includes everyone. Um, and that's not the way it's been for a long time. A lot of the time when we say we, we mean white America. Um, for instance, when we talk about conflict and division, we're like, oh, there's conflict, there's division. America really often only notices that when it's conflict and division among white people. So you can have intense racial polarization, but if white Americans and the people in power are unified, we think that's a unified America. And you can look at like Ronald Reagan's electoral victories for that, where people are like, look, America's coming together. Well, white America is kind of coming together. But Reagan wins 14% of the black vote in 1980, and then only 9% in 1984. So racial polarization is actually increasing. But we mistake that for unity, because what it is really is a stable power structure. Mm. So, you know, ultimately, we want everyone together in the we. The second best thing is to get together the people who really believe in equality, I think, because that's more inclusive. So if you have to pick some group to marginalize, I think it should be the people who are against equality. Absolutely. And that's not what we do now. No question. But you make a compelling case for the action that was taken uh, with African people at the center, of course, in the Civil War, but joined by uh, those who really did want to create this different country. You make a compelling case for the Civil War really being the founding of the country. And I know we'll get into it in a minute, but I'm wondering, you, you begin the text by kind of setting out that framework that we all learned in school. Uh, that Lynn, Marin, Lynn Manuel Miranda seems to be engaged in the project, at least trying to rehabilitate. But you talk about these three legs of this founding stool, the Declaration of Independence, the American Revolution and the Founders Constitution. And I know we'll get into that in our second block more. But as we kind of begin to take take the end of this first block, you know. What what do those three elements mean when it comes to this idea that we have of the United States of America and, and it's kind of founding an origin story, for lack of a better term? Yeah, so there's a lot to say there, but to leave you a sort of a teaser for the next yes. block, we tell ourselves this story like America is committed to equality and we say that in the Declaration and then we fight for that value in the revolution and then we make it into law in the Founders Constitution. And what I'm saying is if you look at the history, none of those things is true. But we can tell a different story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's funny because you 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 uh, evoke several uh, kind of contemporary figures, uh, one of which, of course, is my friend and colleague here at Howard, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones with the 1619 Project. And you say, as you are going 
charting the course and going along, teaching, writing, thinking, when you read her essay in the 1619 Project, where she says, you know, in many ways, that founding is a lie. You say, well, let me sit down and, and convene some of these things I've been thinking about for quite some time and set them to paper. And of course, that's how we end up with the book. What was it about that that assertion that made you say, OK, let me let me finally sit down and work through what that means in terms of constitutional law and its implications for the society? Well, I wanted to think more about the Declaration of Independence and how its meaning has changed over time, really. So that's one of the very striking things that Nicole Hannah-Jones says, and I think I have a slightly different take on the Declaration, right? She says, our ideals were false when they were written. I'm saying what was written down in 1776 isn't our ideals at all. So other people came in and put a different meaning on it. And who are those people? Because those are the real heroes of the American story. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a good place for us to pause. And when we come back on the um, other side of the break, we're going to talk about that Founders Constitution versus the Reconstruction Constitution, which is, uh, like I said, when I heard that lecture, man, I said, let me go get this book. And then when I read the book, I'm like, oh, yeah, we definitely had to have this conversation. So uh, thank you, Prof. We'll, we'll come back on the other side of the break here at the Black Table and resume this conversation with Professor Kermit Roosevelt of the University of Pennsylvania. Back in the morning. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Uh, I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, with Professor Kermit Roosevelt of the University of Pennsylvania. Prof, you walked us right up to uh, rewriting all that history. We learned kindergarten to 12th grader as, uh, was it Howard Zinn that said, or was it uh, Herbert Aptek? I'm trying to remember. Well, when you get a PhD, it's basically what you learn in elementary school with footnotes. But this narrative, it seems it's hard to break, man. So. Walk us through in the first chapters, you talk about this question of the exclusive declaration and the ambiguous revolution. Um, was slavery part of the reason or maybe even the central reason? Or is it clear at all whether or not the colonies broke from George the third and, uh, you know, in England based uh, on the, uh, the fact that England was getting ready to abolish slavery or. But and then maybe more importantly, what is the exclusive declaration that you that you write about? Yeah, so there's, there's a big argument about the role that slavery played in the movement for independence. And, you know, this is one of the things that people push back on very hard if you say it had anything to do with it. So I don't want to overstate that. Um, but I think it is true if you look at the reaction to the Somerset decision. People are very upset about it in the West Indies. They're very vocal about it. They're less vocal about it in the U.S., why is that? It's probably because they're trying to get people together to fight for independence and a pro-slavery justification for independence isn't going to fly all that well in the North. It's not going to produce unity. No taxation without representation. Everyone can believe in that. You know, everyone can say that. So they stick with something that sounds better. And this doesn't mean they're not thinking about slavery, particularly in the South, because if you compare this to the American Civil War, the South secedes over a much lesser threat to slavery, right? The U.S. government in 1860 didn't have the power to eradicate slavery. The British government did. So probably people are thinking about this. They don't talk about it very much. It's a complicated historical question. What I think you get much more clearly is this exclusive declaration bit, which is to say, what is the political theory that Jefferson is articulating in the declaration? So first, what does he mean by all men are created equal? An educated person in 1776 would have understood that as basically a reference to John Locke and the second treatise of government, where what it means is, in a world with no government or no laws, this sort of hypothetical state of nature, which is how enlightenment political philosophy usually starts. No one has an obligation to obey anyone else, which basically means no one is made a king by God. And that's really all that it means. That's all it means to say all men are created equal in 1776. It's saying 
the king doesn't rule by divine right. And then they go on to say governments are formed by consent in order to protect people's natural rights. And then you get the question, when is there a right of rebellion? Which is if the government is threatening your natural rights instead of protecting them, then you have a right to rebel. And the Declaration of Independence is all about a right to rebel on the part of the colonies. And its theory is governments are supposed to protect the rights of the people who form them. And that's why it's exclusive. The government has to protect the insiders doesn't necessarily have any duties to the outsiders. So a lot of people will say, gosh, it's so weird, right? That the colonists are saying, King George is bad for trying to enslave us, but he's also bad for inciting domestic insurrections, which is encouraging the people, the Americans enslaved to rebel. Isn't that inconsistent? And the answer is it's not. So it's wrong for King George to try to enslave the colonists because that's going against insiders. It's not necessarily wrong. It's a different issue at least for the colonists to be enslaving other people who are not members of their political community. So the declaration just means much less than we think it does as it's understood in 1776. Interesting. And then and then you you also help us think about the bill of rights kind of tacked on to that constitution. And whereas in contemporary society we tend to think of it as a seamless kind of document, you say oh no, hold on because that Bill of Rights, which does protect the insiders, and of course, you know, this, this leads to a very, and I wanted to have this conversation with you a bit about the nature of citizenship and whether or not, particularly in the world we live in today, perhaps that's something that we even need to revisit in terms of a concept of citizenship. But given the fact that that, that, that Bill of Rights becomes so important uh, to those who were excluded from that insider status, uh, in those middle chapters, man, you you spared no prisoners. You say, really, what happened was using that Bill of Rights, more importantly, you have, uh, well, what becomes the Bill of Rights with the Reconstruction Amendments, you have all these people who were outsiders who rise up with in collusion with some of the quote unquote insiders to break the back of the founders constitution. And I know we'll get more into that in the next in the next section, but could you walk us through that logic as you say, you know, we're reading this wrong. It isn't Jefferson, it's really the Lincoln era that we should be focusing on as the point of departure for the country we live in now. Yeah, so the main point there is what I was saying before about the declaration as it's understood in 1776, where it's like government exists to protect the insiders and what it does to outsiders doesn't really matter. So if you're an abolitionist, right, that's terrible because your whole point is we're treating these outsiders unjustly and we need to treat them better. So abolitionists trying to argue against slavery and trying to argue in particular that America is an anti-slavery nation, look to the language of the Declaration of Independence because that's the best resource they have and they start reading it differently. They start saying, hey, all men are created equal. That means the government should treat people equally. And this is people like Prince Hall, Benjamin Banneker, Frederick Douglass. A lot of them are black people. So this is sort of a more inclusive founding story. And that's where our ideal of equality comes from. It's not Thomas Jefferson. It's not the Continental Congress. It's the outsiders, the marginalized people in colonial America who are saying there's a different ideal that we believe America should stand for. And it doesn't stand for it then, but they fight for it. And the Republican Party picks it up and Abraham Lincoln does a lot with it. And then it all sort of comes to a head in the Civil War. And that's when the question is really joined. What does America stand for? What values will our nation be built on? Thanks, Prof. I appreciate the fact that uh, and like any master teacher, very generous as we had this conversation, because of course I skipped completely over uh, the uh, 1787 Constitution, <laughs> where, where you make, where you make a uh, you make a very important observation. You said it really isn't natural law driving this at this point because you're not talking about rebelling against uh, 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 your 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 colonial master of the mother country. You've set up your own framework now. So, I mean, there's state law to fight against. There's not natural law as the propelling uh, kind of, uh, as kind of motive as the, as the thrust. But but you do write about how they keep continue, whether it be Lincoln, whether it be Prince Hall, whether it be Fred Douglas, and other, they keep drawing from the language of the, con of the Declaration of Independence, but the Constitution is stands between the Declaration of Independence and this and this fight to create a different type of society. What role does the Constitution play 
in this, particularly when it comes to creating outsiders and the indeterminate status. You walk us through the three first compromise. You talk about this question of whether or not you can own people or not drawn from the Federalist Papers coming through the Constitution. Could you talk a little about the role of the 1787 Constitution in creating this insider outsider status without England being uh, there anymore as the bad guy to, to rebel against? Yeah, so the, the answer there is the 1787 Constitution doesn't do as much as you might think, because it's not really concerned about individual rights. It's not concerned about natural rights. The 1787 Constitution is really trying to make the states into a nation. Mm -hmm. So it's concerned about relationships between the states. It's concerned about relationships with foreign countries. But it doesn't do much at all to protect individual rights, not from the states and not from other individuals. It does protect slavery in several ways. And it does that because slavery is a source of friction between the states. So it's trying to deal with slavery, not as a question of individual rights or natural rights, but as a question of interstate relations. And that's why it actually rewards and protects slavery in various ways. And then the most important thing that the 1787 Constitution does with insiders and outsiders is it has this rule that black people can never be federal citizens. And you might say, no, it doesn't. That's Dred Scott. Right. And everyone knows Dred Scott is wrong because that's the rule that the Supreme Court announced in Dred Scott. As we yeah. said at the beginning, that's Roger Tawney. But the important thing to understand about Dred Scott, I think, is it's a 7-2 decision. This is not a couple of bad apple racist individual Supreme Court justices. This is a super majority of the Supreme Court. And most people say we like to say because we like to think that the 1787 Constitution is good. They say, oh, Dred Scott was wrong. But if Dred Scott was wrong, you still have to explain why were there seven Supreme Court justices who issued that incorrect decision? And the answer is you get seven pro-slavery Supreme Court justices because you have pro-slavery presidents and you have pro-slavery presidents in large part because of the three-fifths compromise, which is part of the 1787 Constitution. So Dred Scott is the product of the system. It's a foreseeable consequence of the political system set up by the 1787 Constitution, even if that rule isn't there in the words. Yes. And, and you know, and this is this is so, so helpful in many ways. I have some friends and colleagues I think about Donald Temple, a lawyer here in uh, in D.C., who's actually from Philly, too. It's an interesting conversion. He often says, you know, Dred Scott wasn't completely overturned. I mean, could you talk a little bit about and this may be getting in the weeds a little bit, but I know the law students will particularly appreciate this. Tawny constructing this idea of national citizenship and citizenship in the state and kind of, I mean, is that something that still animates our politics? The idea is we are, we are Americans. Yeah, but I'm from Mississippi and here the laws. Could you tell, you know, for the lay, lay folk, what does that mean in terms of protections and guarantees or the lack thereof? Well, yeah. So our system of federalism divides authority between the states and the federal government. And you're a citizen of a state. And it, it used to be that if you were a citizen of a state, then you were a citizen of the United States. Now, because of the 14th Amendment, we sort of do it backwards. If you're born in the U.S., you're a citizen of the U.S., and then you're a state citizen, a citizen of whatever state you live in. So we sort of turned that relationship around. Um, one interesting thing to say about Dred Scott, though, is that it's actually based on the Declaration of Independence. So the theory that the government, that Congress can't ban slavery in the territories, that's based on this idea that the government is created to protect the rights of the people who form it, and it can't arbitrarily interfere with those rights. And Justice Taney says, if you say you lose your property just for taking it to a certain place, that's an arbitrary interference with property rights. And people would never give the government the power to do that. Now, I think that's wrong, but it is the theory of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Well, uh, that leads us to the road on the road to civil war. And as we have been watching the 118th Congress, or I guess when it gets formed, the 118th, tear itself into pieces. Um, and everybody's saying, well, this hasn't happened in 100 years. And before that, it was in mid 1850s. It's like, yeah, uh, that is probably uh, something that we probably should revisit or at least look at a little bit more closely, given what you've written, because that was the decade, of course, of Dred Scott and John C. Calhoun and everything that led to the Civil War. When we come back, uh, Prof, I'm very much looking forward to these middle chapters where you write very convincingly about the coalition of folk who rose up and broke the back of that founder's constitution in the civil war and and made the possibility of a different type of society stand up 
So uh, when we come back with Professor Kermit Roosevelt, we are going to continue this conversation, this conversation on the nation that never was, reconstructing America's story. And we're gonna come with the trope that he evokes in this, in this particularly in this section, the reconstruction constitution, which he says is really the foundation of the society we live in today. So back in a moment here at the Black Star Network with the Black Table. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember now to uh, support the Black. Hold on, let me do it again. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support the Black Star Network. Uh, download the app, subscribe, and uh, tell your friends. And we're having some very powerful conversations here across the network on all the shows, including this one. So when we left, uh, Professor uh, Roosevelt, you were helping us understand. Uh, how we got to the crisis that led ultimately to the Civil War. And you write very powerfully, man, when you get into the story of continuity, March of the Declaration, why we tell the standard story and why we shouldn't tell the standard story. And I remember this, of course, wa watching your lecture. You, know, you basically say the Civil War is a rejection in many ways of the Founders Constitution and that the military it took a military and in imposing a different order on the country to, to bring that to bear. And um, I'm sure you'll remember the phrase, man, if I can remember this phrase, when you talk about the five military districts, of course, in reconstruction, you're basically saying this was a different country. <laughs> then, man, that, I really seized me. I'm like, wow, this is a really, it's, it, and it's interesting. Could you talk a little bit about that period of the Civil War and Reconstruction and why that forms the basis of your argument that we're living in a different society than the one Jefferson and, and his uh, comrades imagined? Yeah, so the, the essence of the standard story, as I describe it, is this idea of continuity, right? That our ideals are articulated in 1776, and then we fight for them, and we realize them imperfectly at first, but we work towards them. And it's like the same America with the same values. And what I'm saying is, think about what the values are in the founding. So you got the Declaration of Independence, which says, if you don't think your government is working, you can change it. Right. If you think your government is going against the rights that you wanted it to protect, you can change it. So that's obviously exactly what the South is doing, right? The South signs up, they join the union, they negotiate protections for slavery in the constitution. And now they think, not entirely unreasonably, the nation has turned against us, right? Because the Republican party wants to end slavery. So the Southern states say, we're gonna declare independence and start over. And they invoke the Declaration of Independence and Lincoln rejects that. Lincoln says, I'm gonna use military force to make you stay in the union. And then with respect to the Founders Constitution, the thing to think about there is who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, according to the founders, according to the understanding of 1787. And the answer is they think the states are the good guys. They think the federal government is the threat to liberty because they're thinking about the revolution where the states, of course, are the good guys and the state militias fight off the redcoats. And in Federalist 46, actually, Madison says, Madison, a slave owner from Virginia, says, you might think the federal government is going to interfere with the way that states do things. And if you say that and you're from Virginia, you're thinking about slavery, at least in part. And if that happens, Madison says, the states will join together and fight the federal government. And if it comes to a war, the states will win. And he mm -hmm. says, you know, it will be like the revolution, 13 states fighting against the federal government. Think of the Betsy Ross flag, 13 stars in a circle. Well, guess what? That's what happened. Right. Thirteen states, if you accept the Confederate claims to Missouri and Kentucky, fight against the federal government. And they raise a flag with 13 stars in a circle because that's the first flag of the Confederacy. So it's exactly what the founders thought might happen, except the national government won, which is, from their perspective, the bad guys. 
And then, right, you get the making of a new nation. So if you want me to talk about that now, like yeah, I say no, no, because I mean, it's interesting because there, there's this factor that's floating all along in here that and I wanted to ask you about this as well, because you evoke, of course, Douglas and Prince Hall you, you're reading through Danielle Allen and, and you evoke Nicole Hannah Jones. And you say, you know, Nicole Hannah Jones and, and Michelle Alexander. I mean, these are really patriots, true patriots in the sense that, you know, they're committed to these higher ideals. And I thought about that and I thought about all those black people. Robert Small and all them 189,000 cats that that fought for the union in uniform and the many others who just ran away. Carl G. Woodson's grandparents and father, in fact, and, and, and who escaped. And I'm wondering, you know, that X factor, why do you think these black folk, indigenous people, others who are quote unquote outsiders, what were they fighting for? Was it the ideal in your mind of the of the uh, original declaration? Was it these broader, or was there something else animating their actions? Because ultimately, they are in league with Lincoln and others, and they saved the Union, but helped save the Union. Yeah, well, so I think it's a belief in you know a nation that never was. It's a belief in America, an America that can be but never mm -hmm. has been. You know, as Langston Hughes says. Um, and this is where, like, I agree with Nicole Hannah-Jones the most, I think, when she says people sort of tell a story where it looks like black people are the problem in the story of America. And the standard story is like, yeah, no, we have these ideals, but we don't quite live up to them because slavery is a problem. And if there were no black people in the story, it would go a lot better. And that's completely wrong. Because where our ideals really come from is the fight against slavery led in large part and fought in large part by black people. And we wouldn't have those values if we didn't have black people fighting for their freedom and the freedom of others. And we wouldn't have the 14th Amendment, which is what makes the Bill of Rights meaningful when it starts giving you rights against the state and not just the federal government. We wouldn't have the 14th Amendment if it hadn't been necessary to protect the rights of formerly enslaved people once they become citizens. And why do they become citizens? They become citizens because black people fight in the Civil War. So it's the choice of black people to risk their lives for a nation that has given them nothing, right? A nation that has taken from them in the hopes that they can make this just nation, you know, that exists really only in people's imagination at the time and in sort of political rhetoric, but has never been. It's that sacrifice that sets us on the path to everything that is great about America that we celebrate now in terms of our constitution. Interesting. And I think about this, and I know we'll talk about this in a minute, because you talk about the rejection of reconstruction through redemption. And I think about, of course, uh, our, our late colleague, the great Derek Bell, who talks about the principle of the involuntary sacrifice, where whiteness kind of reconvenes. And in part, it reconvenes by rejecting this promise that is, that is fought for so, 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 so difficult. It's made it's fought for so passionately by these people of African descent. But but before we we get to that, because I want to talk about that, you know, the, the rejection of Reconstruction and which kind of in some ways moves on to today, goes through today. Could you talk a little bit about how you conceive this war as a battle uh, that really has what be, what is the United States, the Union and people of African descent and those fighting to get out of enslavement reject? not only the, the founders constitution in many ways, but impose their will on a, a, on a South that has decided that we are really more true to the Declaration of Independence. I mean, you 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 really state, line it out, and I guess more so, I guess, in, why, in chapter nine, why we shouldn't tell the standard story. You know, for those who remember that history, but remember it probably not in the way that you put it together in terms of narrative, how, why do you use that 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 metaphor, that example, that somehow these in position these military districts are creating something that is basically a different country than the one that was founded in 1787? Yeah. So the Declaration of Independence says basically one people, right? And we get to decide who we are. We get to decide who the insiders are. We can declare our independence and govern ourselves the way we want. And the South invokes that and they say it explicitly and they celebrate the 4th of July during the Civil War and they say we are the true heirs of independence. And the United States rejects that. 
And we fight a war to force those states to stay in the union. So it's not consent of the governed anymore. And then Congress says, and you will accept formerly enslaved people as citizens. That's the Civil Rights Act. And it seems as though maybe that's not going to stick if it's just a federal law. So they need a constitutional amendment. Congress drafts the 14th Amendment, which provides for birthright citizenship, sends that out to the states, and the states reject it. And actually, not just the southern states, Maryland and Delaware reject it too. So this is something that people, I think, really widely do not understand. In 1867, the 14th Amendment is dead. It is not going to get ratified by three quarters of the states. And that's when Congress dissolves the governments in the former Confederate states, turns them into military districts, and makes them write new constitutions with the formerly enslaved participating. So now you've got a new political community, you've got a new set of people, and you've got a new political structure, and you've got different people in power. And that's what I say is making new states. So they've got the same borders, but they've got a different body of citizens. They've got a different political structure. They've got a different set of people in power. Um, you know, if you think that a state is anything other than its names and its border, that's a different state. And those are the states that ratified the 14th Amendment. And that's what I say makes us a new nation. That is remarkable. And, 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 I, and I'm sure uh, some of our regular viewers, including those who are connected to the Zen education program, my friend Deb Menkard and others who have been pushing for the last several years, uh, a teach reconstruction curriculum are elated to hear you talk about this. It's very important. In fact, uh, one of the one of the central figures in there, of course, is uh, our colleague Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who's, uh, whose brother just got <laughs> uh, named a minority leader in the Democratic Party in Congress, Hassan out there at Ohio State. Reconstruction, man. I mean, how important is it for particularly K-12 curricula and folk here in the United States? How important is it for us to really teach and learn Reconstruction as a part of this kind of imagining a different country? Well, Reconstruction is the birth of America. Like That's my whole thesis. That's mm -hmm. where our values come from. I mean, they're articulated in the struggle against slavery, but they don't enter the Constitution until Reconstruction. And that's what gives us rights against the states. That's what sets up the whole model of federal rights that protect you from state governments, which is where all of our big, important constitutional law cases come from. So, you know, if you ask people, what's a great constitutional law decision? And they say Brown v. Board of Education, or they say Loving against Virginia, or Roe v. Wade, or Miranda, um, any of those decisions that people know about, those are Bill of Rights decisions in the sense that those are rights that are mentioned in the first 10 amendments, but they're really 14th Amendment decisions. They're really Reconstruction decisions because the Supreme Court is protecting people from the states and not the federal government. That only becomes possible after Reconstruction. Interesting. And, and of course, as we're seeing the early days of uh, Kataji Brown Jackson on the Supreme Court, it really is something to listen to the oral arguments and hear how so much of what she's saying. And of course, Soto Mayor King is really drawn from those Reconstruction Amendments, even to the point where she's trying to say, OK, y'all want to be strict constructionists? No problem. Let's go look at the 14th Amendment. <laughs> so uh, but when we come back, Prof, actually, that's a good segue, because when we come back, we want to talk a little bit about the way forward. You end uh, the book with uh, the better story the story that we need to tell. And we wanna talk about your vision of what we can do and how dialogue and communication is important, how looking forward rather than all the way backward is important. And we wanna blend that as well with some of the some of your work on the Presidential Commission uh, for the Supreme Court in terms of how this, the, you imagine the judici judiciary playing a role. So we'll be back in a moment with Professor Kermit Roosevelt here at the Black Table. Join us after the break. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. 
We're going to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind $100,000, so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr. Remember to support the Black Star Network. Uh, all of our shows, our network, got some big things in store in 2023. And we're finishing up today with Professor Kermit Roosevelt, professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. Prof, you have been knee deep in some very important conversations over the last couple of years. Of course, there's been a big clamor about the Supreme Court. Um, and if you want to maybe mention some of the ways that we get to today after Reconstruction, uh, whether it be the post-World War II movements of the court, the, the kind of clawback after Reconstruction and the redemption as the court begins to kind of re, try to reestablish those that earlier arc in terms of trying to keep people outside of, of the, the legal universe here in the United States. But as you envision a different story, a better story, as you say, you know, moving forward, how do we do that? I mean, in your mind, how do we imagine a country that does draw from that reconstruction constitution and rejects the kind of clawbacks and continues to move forward to create a, a different kind of society? Well, so the better story part, that's pretty simple. Like our standard story has this three-part structure where there's a short document that states our ideals, it's the Declaration of Independence. There's a war that's fought for those ideals, it's the Civil War. There's a longer document that makes those ideals into law, it's the 1787 Constitution. And what I'm saying is basically none of that is true if you look at it closely, but we can tell the same story because there is a short document that states our ideals, it's the Gettysburg Address, and you can memorize the whole thing. No one memorizes the entire Declaration of Independence. Um, and then there's a war that's fought for those ideals, it's the Civil War. And then there's a longer document that makes them into law. It's the Reconstruction Constitution. And we can tell the story and we can be honest about what really happened, which is the problem that we're having with our standard story. We can tell it honestly and it's still inspirational because our values really do come from a struggle against slavery. And America really is born in a war for liberty. And it's the war that ends slavery. You know, there's all these things we want to say about the revolution and the declaration, but they're not quite true and people you know, won't accept it anymore. So the better story, that's pretty easy. How do we actually like live out those values and make them real? Well, that's harder because we get these expressions of idealism and we get these moves towards a more democratic society. And then there's a backlash. And the backlash to the first reconstruction is redemption, which is basically the regional takeover of a white supremacist minority, often sometimes majority. But a national minority takes over a region of the country, reimposes racial hierarchy. That's the first redemption. That's the overthrow of Reconstruction when federal military support goes away and basically white supremacist terrorists overthrow the legitimate governments of a large part of the country. Um, then, for various reasons, there's not a lot of progress for almost 100 years, but in the post-World War II era, the civil rights movement and the second Reconstruction come along, and again, we move in the direction of equality. But again, there's a backlash. And this time it's national. So now racial hierarchy is being restored at the national level. And in part, this is minoritarian. And I can talk a little bit about the way in which the federal constitution makes it possible for a minority to take over. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it's about trying to reinstall racial hierarchy in kind of an insider outsider way and cutting government benefits so that they don't go to the wrong people because you don't want to acknowledge that those people are insiders and equals. And this is all best understood, I think, as the second redemption. It's a reaction to the second reconstruction. It starts with the Reagan presidency. It's tied to originalism, which is an embracing of founding values and a rejection of reconstruction, basically, because that's what the Warren court was doing, reconstruction. Um, and it's kind of like the founding, it's kind of like the Confederacy because those two things are very similar. And what we've seen most recently is 
it's minoritarian. Now it's a minority and they're trying to take over the entire country and they're kind of succeeding. So during the Trump presidency, you had the executive branch, the president held by someone who lost the popular vote. You had a senators who represent a minority of the population controlling the Senate. You had in the House a lot of gerrymanders, partisan gerrymanders, that let a minority of a state elect a majority of that state's representatives. And you have the Supreme Court, again, 6-3 Republican majority, but four of those justices were appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote. So a minority has taken over the national government. They're trying to hold on and they're trying to impose basically these neo-Confederate slash founding ideals. And, and it's interesting as you as you line this out, and as you've said, you've just said, this movement sees itself as being faithful, being true to the origins of the country. And you talk about uh, the idea of individualism versus collectivity. I mean, the idea of redistribution and taxation, they say, no, we're against that. So, you know, no, 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 that was revisited in the mid 19th century. So, I mean, but, but, and, and this question of unity versus justice, I mean, all that, if we're being patriotic, no, you're not being patriotic. What, what about justice? No, what about all of us? No, inclus inclusivity isn't at the, at the heart of this. And, and so having lined all that out, um, you set this up perfectly because of course we think about the rulings of the Supreme Court, uh, Bush versus Gore, which, as we know, they said, don't cite this for anything else uh, until we get the numbers to cite it. <laughs> but you you served on this President's Commission, the Supreme Court, and it's interesting in reading the report that you all generated and in listening to you talk about it in other venues where, you know, as you say, it's regrettable that you all work primarily in silos and there was no formal mechanism to have conversation. But still, um, the question of the, the legitimacy of the judiciary uh, is interesting in the context, again, of what you just raised. And you write in the book that you know the senators from the three largest states and the senators from the 61 smallest states represent, have, have votes. And it's like, wait a minute, you outclassed us. You talk about the Electoral College and, and this question of legitimacy. It's one thing when you're talking about electoral politics and you're talking about, of course, the legislative branch, the executive branch. But you say now that the judiciary has the potential to have its legitimacy undermined as a result of this kind of minoritarian rule in pursuit of this imaginary origin story that has some legitimacy if we look at it in terms of the, 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 the structures that we have. But on this commission, you all visit all these hot button issues in terms of trying to perhaps shore up the legitimacy of, of, the, of the Article Three courts, the federal courts, everything from the size of the courts to potentially term limits, uh, questions of expanding the court, maybe restricting jurisdiction, uh, dealing with questions of procedure. Could you talk a little bit about how we might even reimagine the courts at this moment uh, when clearly the country, the people in the country don't match the framework of the country in terms of this this kind of ongoing battle? Yeah. So the basic problem with the Supreme Court, I think, is that the drafters of the Constitution didn't anticipate political parties. So they left the appointment of Supreme Court justices sort of up to chance, like how many appointments does a president get? Well, it depends on who retires or dies. And if you don't have political parties, that's OK, because the justices that one president will appoint aren't that different from the justices that another president will appoint. But if you do have political parties and the nation is polarized and the legal elite is polarized, which didn't used to be the case, then you get political influence on the appointments and you get justices embodying very different constitutional visions. So you've got sort of like the constitutional vision of reconstruction, which is more the Democratic Party. And that's like Ketanji Brown Jackson. Um, and then you've got the constitutional vision of the founding, which is a lot like the Confederacy, I keep saying. So, you know, if you look at January 6th, um, there are people flying Revolutionary War flags. There are people notoriously flying Confederate battle flags. They're marching happily together. And that shouldn't surprise anyone, right? Because mm -hmm. those are very similar ideologies. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that it's possible now for a minority to capture the Supreme Court. So you've got your popular vote losing president. You've got your senators representing a minority of the American people. If timing works out for them, they can still appoint a majority of the Supreme Court. That's exactly what happened. And then the sitting justices time their retirements. Um, they can hold the Supreme Court forever 
Basically, if the Republican Party wins one out of every three or even one out of every four presidential elections and the justices just retire under Republican presidents, that branch of government is controlled forever by the Republican Party. Right? And that's not the way it should work in a democracy. So ultimately, the composition of the courts should be responsive to presidential elections. And the way to get there is term limits. So if you make each justice serve in active duty for 18 years, each president gets two appointments, then eventually the composition of the Supreme Court comes back in line with the outcome of national elections, which is the fairest and most democratic way to do it. Interesting. I mean, and, and I know we only have a couple of minutes left. There's so many more questions I want to ask you. I mean, in, 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 in chapter 13, as you end it, and I love the way you write, say making a more just nation is not about returning to our origins or making America anything again. It is about making America. That is all. That is everything. You know, as we think about these demographic shifts in the country and you write about the South. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of somebody who you rely upon a great deal throughout uh, the, the narrative, which is, of course, W.B. Du Bois and Black Reconstruction. And the talk he gave in South Carolina, I think it was the mid-1940s, called Behold the Land, where he says the future of the country is in the South. And then, of course, our, our colleague Amani Perry uh, writes about that in her recent book on turning on, on America in the South. Any thoughts on how demographics may force this question in a way that couldn't have been anticipated in the 19th century shifts in demographics or, or, you know, is the South irretrievably lost or are these, some of these States that are now tipping the scale, are they, you know, how, how can they be reformed? And is it, is it a local state question? Is it a question of organizing? I mean, any thoughts on any of that? Well, I don't think the South is irretrievably lost. I mean, I wouldn't want to say that anything is irretrievably lost. No question. Um, I would worry more about the really rural states, uh, you know, because that's that's where you've got a greater disparity, I think, now. Um, and you've got less potential for demographic shifts. So demographics, I think, are very encouraging. You know, if you look at younger voters, they're more reconstruction oriented than founding oriented, right? They're more pro-equality, I would say. Um, and the millennials seem to be staying that way, right? They're not getting more conservative as they get older. And then we're getting increasing racial diversity. So I think the demographics are very positive. And what we're seeing now is really sort of a reaction to that. There's um, a temporary white majority that sees its majority status imperiled and is worried about losing political power. And we're seeing the last desperate attempt to hold on. And I think eventually that's going to lose. It's just a question of how long it takes and what form it takes. Mm -hmm. In fact, I love the way that you uh, write in chapter 13, the better story. You say, you know, the choice is up to us and we keep trying. So, I mean, what, what's the alternative? It really is no alternative for, for us as a species either. Um, probably want to thank you for joining us. And, and, and maybe we got about 30 seconds in. Uh, you're a fiction writer as well. I know when I went to law school, the big the big writer was Scott Turow. <laughs> After one L, he started writing all those novels. And I got a copy in the shadow of the law here, man. I said, oh, I have, I have one of Professor Washington. I mean, if you watch Professor Roosevelt's books here. Um, could you talk a minute about your, your work in fiction? Uh, you mentioned Allegiance, for example. And I mean, why take fiction on? It's just a way to kind of another way to narrate stories, man. Well, I think that stories are really the, the way that you change people. So, you know, you tell people a story and they learn from that in a way that they don't necessarily accept analytical arguments. So like, if you're trying to change the way that people think about the world or people think about the nation, I think that stories are really important. And that's kind of part of the point of the nation that never was, is we tell ourselves these stories about who we are and where we come from and who our heroes are. And the story that we're telling ourselves now is not the right story. Historically, it's not very accurate. And also it teaches us bad lessons about who we should believe in and what we should do. Absolutely. Well, we want to thank you, Prof, not only for um, your work generally, uh, but for this book, The Nation That Never Was, for your continuing work, uh, service not only to the country, but to our greater humanity. And uh, for those of us at HBCUs, and there's a lot of HBCU students up there at Penn, I mentioned Layla, who came from Howard, Thank you all for strengthening that pipeline because you know that's that you're, you're literally living out what we're going to have to do to make America as opposed to make America great again. So, thank you again, Professor uh, Roosevelt. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, of course. So we'll be back in a moment to clear the table, and we'll get ready for next week here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment.
hatred on the streets. A horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. In 1896, W.E.B. Du Bois was appointed uh, an assistant instructor at the University of Pennsylvania, the institution that our guest today, Professor Kermit Roosevelt, works at today. And so Professor Roosevelt's ancestral colleague, W.E.B. Du Bois, the year that he spent in Philadelphia, his wife, he and his wife, Nina, uh, the year that he began research on what became his book, The Philadelphia Negro, that was also the year that his doctoral dissertation at Harvard University, one of Professor Roosevelt's alma maters, published the first in its Harvard historical series. Uh, that first publication from the Harvard historical series was W.E.B. Du Bois's dissertation turned into a book, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America. And here's what was published under Du Bois's name in the year he spent in Philly. Dr. Du Bois says that, um, the most obvious question which this study suggests is how far in a state can a recognized moral wrong safely be compromised? And although this chapter of history can give us no definite answer suited to the ever varying aspects of political life, yet it would seem to warn any nation from allowing through carelessness and moral cowardice any social evil to grow. No persons would have seen the Civil War with more surprise and horror than the revolutionists of 1776. Yet from the small and apparently dying institution of their day arose the walled and castled slave power. From this, we may conclude that it behooves nations as well as men and women, people to do things at the very moment when they ought to be done. Professor Kermit Roosevelt, extending, complicating, uh, in some ways correcting and holding up that vision that Dr. Du Bois lined out uh, a century and a third ago is very important that we sit with the conversation that we had today and imagine making America, making the world differently better than it has been before. So glad y'all joined us at the Black Table. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, everybody take care of themselves and subscribe to the Black Star Network and tell your friends. Talk to you all soon.